So hopefully you can now uh, see my uh, screen in front of you. And uh, I hope that you can see that there's a gorgeous golden retriever at the top. And uh, then myself and my little dog here, who's called Jackson, he's um, a little Chihuahua cross, Jack Russell, um, one of one of my adored pets, one of my adored dogs. And um, this, is, as I said, this webinar is about the three myths of about dog to dog communication. And I had a real problem, actually, restricting myself to three because um, there are just so many different things that I want to share with you and want to talk about when I'm when I'm discussing um, how dogs interact together. And one of the reasons why um, I'm particularly interested in this, and I, I lecture all around the world on various topics to do with um, dog behaviour and cat behaviour, actually, that's my, my other love, um, is that actually something that not many people will know about me is that the reason that I got into this industry in the first place is that I actually had a dog, I had a golden retriever, not this one, um, a previous one, um, who had a really quite serious dog to dog aggression problem. And at that stage, all those years ago, you know, 25 odd years ago, um, actually, there was very little information out there. And, and what there was was very poor information. Um, so I was that person who took that poor dog to a stomp and jerk dog training class with uh, choke chains and compulsive methods and, uh, you know, lots of um, aversives used in the class. And, you know, to my shame and horror now, when I look back on it, um, what I will tell you 100% is that I made the dog more aggressive with other dogs. And um, even after having done that at you know pretty much a, a young age, um, I knew that it wasn't right. I knew that there must be a better way. And I found a book that changed my life. And that book was Think Dog by John Fisher. And I really hope that lots of you have read the book or have heard of John Fisher um, because he eventually became my mentor, actually. And although he sadly passed away in 1997, um, I spent several years, um, first of all, as, as I like to call it, as his official stalker, um, because I, I basically pestered the poor chap um, until he gave in and, uh, and, you know, gave me effectively an apprenticeship in dog behavior with him. And after many years, I actually became his practice manager and his um, his a senior behaviorist in his practice um, and he was an incredible person to work with and for um, and his voice is in my head every single day um, he was a great Yorkshireman and his his most favorite expression was what's the practical application of that then uh, which I think serves me extremely well you know it's all very well having good theories but you know frankly what are you going to do with it what are you how are you going to make this work for you this fantastic theory so um, that's a little bit about me and a, a bit, I guess, about how I came to be um, in this industry, because having read that book, I then discovered actually that there were courses out there um, that you could do. And um, at that stage, it was uh, what's now known as the Think Dog Certificate course. And I did that course. And quite honestly, it changed my life because um, I'm now doing something that I am massively passionate about. I hope you uh, realize that and that um, I love you know, doing every day. Um, you know, I get up in the morning and I thank my lucky stars for doing something that I am so passionate about and so enjoy. Um, so this is a little bit about me. Um, I am a certified clinical animal behaviorist, uh, which basically sounds like I ought to be in some sort of institution. And there are days where I feel like I probably ought to be. Um, but it's really regarded as being, um, you know, something that's very important, actually, particularly for referring vets. Um, it's pretty much the only... Um, accreditation that the Royal College of Veterinary Surgeons currently um, acknowledge. So I've I've uh, made sure that I'm up there and have, have done the work to you know align myself with that. I'm a full member of the Association of Pet Behaviour Counsellors um, and a very proud member of the Association of Pet Dog Trainers in this country because I really do believe that actually um, it's not good enough just to say that you are a behavior specialist. It's vitally important, actually, that if you're going to offer behavioral advice, that you're also a really good trainer. Um, and actually, so many of the behavioral problems that I see, um, I, I start in terms of resolving them by doing some really good 
training you know there's really no substitute for for fabulous training um positive reinforcement of course um i call myself a clicker trainer although i, I don't always use a clicker um and um you know i think that's it's um it's a bit of a shame really that uh, i think you know training has become a little bit of a of a sort of an underdog to the you know the behaviorist um title um, i don't think it should be i think you can do fabulous things with good training and um, this is one of my another of my dogs this is uh, sky again apple of my eye i absolutely adore all my dogs and um, they often appear on uh, videos that i show in fact you're going to see a couple of them this evening on videos and also uh, feature in various books so the other thing i do in my spare time is write books uh, this is book number 25 and um, i promise you that the 61 five star customer reviews on amazon are not all my mother um, although she likes to think she is an expert on the interweb, um, it's not all her. So um, that's my my little sort of um, bit of showing off, I guess, because I think it's quite hard to get lots of good reviews on Amazon. And I'm quite proud of that. So as I mentioned earlier, um, actually, I'm finding it very difficult to uh, to restrict myself um, to only three myths of dog-to-dog uh, -dog communication this evening. And just before I sort of launch us into to those, what I want to just do at this stage is to, to set a little bit of background, um, and hopefully not in a boring way, in a, in a good way, um, because I think that there are lots of difficulties for human beings when they're looking at um, and responding to dog-to-dog uh, -dog interactions. And there are a number of reasons for this. Uh, but the very first of those actually is just how fast dogs are. Um, I don't think we should ever underestimate the fact that a dog can react in a, a quarter of a second, which is the time that it takes for a human brain to recognize that actually something has occurred. And in that quarter of a second, the chances are that they can have, um, you know, run quite a good distance, that they can have responded to perhaps uh, the threat from another dog, um, and potentially even that they can bite in that time as well. Um, so just to give you a kind of a little bit of an idea about that, um, I've got this fabulous bit of video. And this is actually a clip of a dog that um, was in a rescue center at this stage. Um, and it came in with a behavioral problem. Uh, which was uh, food guarding. And so it guards the food that's in its bowl. And so actually the very, very good uh, trainer behaviorist who's who's helping the dog um, is doing a little bit of work with it and feeding the dog, putting treats into the bowl so that it won't feel that a human hand coming close to the bowl is threatening. Uh, but what's interesting really about this clip is actually um, just how uh, fast the dog is when it starts to respond. So we've got a, a, a the full version, if you like, of the dog behaving. And then, let's see if I can play it again for you, because it needs to be uh, needs to be slowed down. This is the slowed down version. So this is um, the clip slowed down. I hope it's running okay on your systems. Um, but the clip slowed down so that it's actually um, running at, I think it's something like um, an eighth of the speed. And so you'll see that she's, this lady is sort of feeding treats out of her hand to put them into the bowl, which is theoretically the best thing to do. And then you see the dog make a decision to actually react. And unfortunately for us, I can't even move the camera fast enough to catch the, the number of bites that are shown there. So in a, a lecture or masterclass, I often like to ask, you know, how many times do you think that the dog bit um, in the space of what was effectively a quarter of a second in real time. And actually, the answer is, is pretty shocking because it's six times. So the dog actually manages to bite the person in that time, in that space of time, six times before she can even react and pull her hand away. And hats off to her because she doesn't, she doesn't react. She doesn't move away. She doesn't, you know, scream and throw her toys out of her pram. You know, it's, it's pretty impressive stuff. So, um, you know, well, well done to her, because obviously um, any kind of reaction away from the dog in this scenario is going to unfortunately reinforce it. Um, what's kind of interesting, I think, in this um, this particular case is obviously this dog has, is very well practiced at this behavior. And the good thing is that you don't see any blood. You know, these are inhibited bites. So although the dog is saying, you know, I really uh, feel very threatened and I'm going to do something about it, I'm going to be proactive. You know, thankfully, there's no injury uh, to the human. And we have to say, 
you know, thank you to the dog for using inhibited biting in this scenario. Um, because, you know, boy, does that make a difference, um, as anyone will know who, who specializes in aggression as I do. So that's a little bit about why it's difficult for us to assess dog to dog interactions when it's due to, hum uh, to sorry, canine speed and perhaps human slowness. And then the next thing that makes it difficult for us is context. And I, I'm sorry, it's sort of naughty of me really to use this picture, but it is one that I particularly love because you don't have to be a sort of facial um, expression expert to be able to see that this particular expression is is really not very real at all you know that there's um, there's fakery behind this uh, smile and actually context in uh, dog behavior is all important so what I'd sort of encourage you to to remember and those of you who've seen my um, signals of preemptive aggression webinar uh, prior to this one will remember that Context is everything. Um, where you might see a dog wagging its tail doesn't always mean that the dog is happy, for example. Um, you know, a dog will wag its tail, uh, particularly if it's sort of low uh, to, to its uh, rear end and quite fast tail wagging where the dog is very uncertain. And actually, I get people um, who ring up uh, my office here because they know that um, I specialize in aggression cases and when they speak to me they're often extremely upset because actually they'll say you know and as he bit me he was wagging his tail you know this is devastating stuff um, and I have to then of course explain that actually this is all about context um, to a dog tail wagging is much more about disseminating scent than it is about that visual signal of the tail wag itself. And so from a human point of view, we focus in on the visual, but from the dog's point of view, what he's trying to do is wag his tail to disseminate scent to say, I'm unhappy in this situation, please help me. So as we go through and we look at our myths, um, please remember, context is everything. It's really important. I don't want anybody emailing me tomorrow and saying, um, you know, well, because my dog uh, did X, that means Y. Because I will come back to you and I will say, what's the context? Give me the description. Really important that we look at that. Looking at dog-to-dog -dog interactions is also complex because <laughs> We as humans have lots of assumptions and um, I know it's sort of easy to sit there and think, well, you know, maybe I don't have too many. But let me tell you, we all do, me included. And I think being aware of it is so important when we're looking at um, dog behavior and particularly dog dog stuff. Um, it could be something as basic as having a little bit of a breed bias. You know, either you love the breed or you're a little bit uncertain about the breed for whatever reason or type. Or it could be because actually you have an assumption based on something that you have read about in the past or you've seen on TV um, or somebody that you uh, believe wholeheartedly told you and uh, about dog behavior. And I think that, you know, my message to everybody is you question everything. Um, I love it, actually, you know, in masterclasses and interactive workshops and seminars um, when people ask me genuine questions. You know, I'm not I'm not overly keen on people arguing for the sake of it. I can get that at home. Um, but what I love in a, in a seminar is where somebody says, you know, wow. OK, well, what's that based on? You know, where, how did you come to that thought? Um, you know, explain to me, show me the science behind it. And I think that is really healthy. That's really good. So actually, um, one of the things I'm going to talk about tonight um, is about how actually I have questioned for some years now the sort of idea about calming signals and what those might actually mean. Um, and I'm sure lots of you um, in the room this evening will have heard about calming signals and, you know, have, uh, you know, uh, perhaps even adopted the expression or you've wondered about them yourself. You know, what is a calming signal? You know, are they really um, intended to calm the other dog down, for example? So this picture is actually here because the chances are that if you're really into dog body language in the way that I am, and trust me, I eat, sleep, drink, you know, consume it for breakfast. I'm totally obsessed with watching dogs and observing dogs and cats. Um, but the chances are that you'll look at this picture and what you'll see or what you'll think you'll see is that there's a possibility that that's a stress yawn. And what I want to tell you is that 
it's really fantastic and it's really good that you might ask yourself, is this a stress yawn? Because actually the rest of humanity, you know, all those other kind of normal human beings that are out there, all those ones that are watching EastEnders or whatever it is on TV right now, as opposed to being on a webinar with me, you know, they're, they're kind of normal people. Um, so, you know, you, you're special. And what makes you special is that you would look at this and you'd say, I wonder, is that a stress yawn? But what I'm actually going to tell you is that that's an anticipatory yawn. This is a dog who's anticipating getting something good. And so the system, the dog system, allows for the perhaps needing a little bit more oxygen. It, the requirement says you might need to run about. There might be something exciting happen, uh, happening. So therefore, you need a bit more oxygen. And so that's why the dog is doing the start of a yawn here. So you're absolutely right to look at it and go, why is the dog yawning? You know, that's really the question you need to ask yourself. But beware of assumptions. As we go through, and particularly as we look at video clips, it's really important, I think, that we don't um, make assumptions based on good and bad. Um, to me, there's no such thing as good and bad. There's just what's useful and what's not useful. So that's kind of why I say that at this stage. Um, also in the mix of what makes dog to dog interactions so difficult. And I bet every single one of you that has ever walked a dog or owned a dog will understand this, which is that human beings come attached to these blooming dogs. They're always at the other end of the lead or very nearly always at the other end of the lead. And when they are often, as this um, image shows, um, they really do a fantastic job of messing things up. And sometimes that just by virtue of being there, you know, it's just by virtue of the fact that actually you're on the end of the lead and therefore you're restraining the dog or you're in close proximity to the dog. And actually the dog therefore feels that it needs to um, take action because you're uh, close to him or her. So it's one of those things that we always have to take into consideration. Um, the reality is that we can't sort of say, well, we're going to do without that person's interference. Um, and although we would try and minimise it, I mean, for example, in this picture, you can see that the dog's actually on a choke chain. And I hope that you can see what effect that has on the dog's physiology. So the front end is now off the ground. You know, he's, he's sort of rearing up into the air. Um, his direct eye contact towards the other dog, his muzzle is pushed forward You know, everything about this posture for this dog is going to tell the other dog, you know, get out of here. Um, this is, you know, scary stuff. Um, you can see Hackles up here. That's his adrenaline that's just created um, what's known as pilar erection, which is the Hackles up. And it doesn't actually denote aggression, but what it does denote is arousal. It says he's getting ready for, in his mind, flight or fight. And I think you can tell that he's not intending to actually run away in this situation. And of course, he can't because he's actually restrained by uh, the effect of the choke chain here as well. So human interference can certainly exacerbate, if not cause, quite a lot of dog to dog um, conflict without, of course, without meaning to. And on the other hand with that is that actually, I have to be honest and say that I'm one of these people that says, it's not just about letting the dogs get on with it either. I see lots and lots and lots of interactions out and about, um, even when I'm with my own dogs, for example, out in the park. And I think to myself, you know, that's a situation where an owner ought to be getting involved. They ought to be taking responsibility and saying, you know, hang on a minute, I'm, I'm the other half of your team here and I'm either going to help protect you um, as a team member or I'm going to actually step in and create an intervention so that my own dog or your own dog doesn't get bullied. They don't get themselves into situations that they can't handle. Um, and sometimes, you know, I'll even see, for example, um, if I'm walking on in a woodland path and I see uh, another dog walking towards me, perhaps uh, with or even without an owner, because the owner's quite a long way away talking on their mobile phone, um, I will even make a decision that we're going to hightail it out of there. You know, I'm going to turn around and take my dogs with me and take a different route because I have done a very rapid assessment of the other dog approaching. And I've said, come on, guys, we just don't need the grief. Let's let's just hightail ourselves out of here and have a lovely, relaxing walk rather than getting into something that might become a confrontation. So I think it's one of these um, areas where it's a, a very difficult judgment call. And if you're like me and you're helping other owners to uh, do the best with their dogs, then 
sometimes what you'll find actually is that teaching the owner when to intervene and when to step back is, you know, half the battle. Um, and if we can do that, then, you know, I always feel that actually we've, we've, you know, we've done a good job. You know, it's a, a really important aspect that we need to look at. So with all that in mind, uh, let's let's talk about some myths. And as I said, I've sort of struggled to um, to reduce it to three because I could have easily presented 33 this evening and had you still here at two o'clock in the morning. But thought probably it wasn't the best plan for most people. Um, so with that in mind, what is this? What do you what do you think? What comes to mind when you see this particular body posture in a dog? And lots of people being very honest and uh, and, and giving me feedback. That's fantastic. Um, if you've been on one of my masterclasses, you will know that like QI, the obvious answer is nearly always not the one I'm after. So the temptation here, I think, is to say the first thing that comes into your mind, which probably is a play bow. And actually what I want to tell you is that you get full marks if you remove the word play from the beginning of that and you said it's a bow. And there's a couple of reasons for that. Uh, the first is actually that if you look at this, even if you wanted to describe it as a play bow, it isn't a true play bow at all, is it? You can see that the dog's tail is held in a sort of um, a, a posture which is kind of relaxed, but but down. And if this was a true what we would previously have described as play bow, the tail probably would be up in the air. So actually, this is a taught behavior. This is a trick that I've taught my dog to do for the photo shoot. Um, so hence, he does, you know, it's a useful thing to have in a photo shoot, of course, isn't it? Have a dog that will do that. Uh, but actually, beyond that, what I would argue is that it's a real misnomer for us ever to describe a bow posture as a play bow. Um, so that's myth number one the bow being a play bow. And now I'm going to tell you something that's probably going to slightly change your life because I'm sure that everybody recognises that posture. Um, you know, everybody recognises the dog in that posture with its tail up, perhaps inviting another dog to play. And yet what I'll now invite you to do is that when you walk your dogs tomorrow or the next day, is that actually when you see this posture, I would say I'm going to hazard a guess here because I've been studying dogs uh, interacting and particularly this uh, one of these uh, gestures, this one particularly uh, for the last two years. So I hazard a guess and say to you that actually 90 percent of the time when you see this posture, it does not result in play. And yet we call it kind of traditionally a play bow. So that's an, that's an interesting thing, isn't it? We've, we've got ourselves into this sort of little myth, uh, which is that we've got so used to being told that this is a play bow that we all now refer to it as that. Um, well, from this point onwards, I hope, fingers crossed, um, you and I won't, because what I would like you to do is to look at it as a bow and then look at the effect that it has. So this is... Um, my uh, my girl, I've, you've already seen her in the picture at the beginning, and she's a collie something cross, uh, possibly a bit of husky in there. I uh, don't know. Got a sort of lovely husky fied tail. I think she looks a bit like a Samoyed, but um, she doesn't do the barking like a Samoyed, but she does do a bit of howling like a husky. So there we go. Um, so this is her out and about meeting um, another dog that she's never met before. And um, what you'll see is actually if you're astute about noticing, and I'll, I'll play this again just in case you need me to, um, is that there's a little play bow or a bow, we previously called it play bow, from this guy, the puggle. So her tail drops as he approaches. She says, oh, I think I see a twinkle in your eye, which is a little scary for a female dog. And then when they go to part ways, not to try and get her to play, but to actually create distance between them, he does that posture. He does that bow. And the more times that I see this, the more I think actually what I'm looking at is that little gesture that says, move away from me. Now that move away from me gesture, if the other dog is feeling in a playful mood, might result in a chase sequence. You know, it might res result in something which is a really pleasurable chase sequence. And then the two dogs will have a little chase, have a little play, have a little game. Lovely. But 
90% of the time, and I'm hazarding that as a guess, please nobody email me tomorrow and say, I think it's 91% or it's 89%. Um, about 90% of the time, it's this that occurs, that actually the dogs move away from each other. So I think that's a really um, fascinating little bit of uh, kind of misinformation that human beings have you know we've, we've we've seen that it sometimes results in play and therefore we've got ourselves caught up with it and we somehow think that it's not necessarily inevitable but that's what that gesture means i'm going to show you another one now um, and this is um this is a tie ridgeback actually which we don't we don't see many of them here though we do have them here but we don't see many um this is in the states actually and this is this is a dog that's sort of um, being introduced, if you like, by its owner to another dog, which is over here. And what I'd like you to do is to, particularly if you've um, perhaps uh, looked at the Learn to Talk Dog course before, or if you've uh, been on one of my webinars before, look at this dog's body posture in terms of its frontal alignment, how straight the dog's body posture is, and so on. And then, you know, really ask yourself, is this a, a playful scenario? Um, where we see this particular gesture. <laughs> the owner says, you know, do you want to play? And I think the answer is, no, I really don't want to play. I would actually like this dog to move out of my space. And the way that I'm going to try and make that other dog move is with that bow gesture. Look at the straight front, look at the uh, direct facial expression towards the other dog. When it doesn't work, the dog then moves its face away a little bit. But it's very much about trying to move the other dog out of its space rather than engage the dog in some sort of um, play relationship. And I want to be very clear here because um, I'm not saying that play, oh, that bows never result in being play bows. You know, I think there are lots of times when they do, but actually far more times when it's the one dog saying to another, I want you to move out of my space. And when we think about it, that's not so crazy really, because that little uh, bow gesture is exactly what a predator would do to a prey animal to try and make it move. And why would it want a prey animal to move? The answer is so it can chase it. So this is, the bow is part of the eye stalk chase predatory sequence that all dogs have in their genetic makeup. And sometimes they'll use it for, you know, social purposes, good social purposes. And other times they'll use it to say, I really want you to move away from me. So when you're out walking your dogs and you see one dog do this to another, always a good question is to ask yourself, you know, what was the purpose of that? And what was the result? Because actually nearly always the result tells you, um, you know, what the intention was. So if the dogs move away from each other, chances are it actually it was space creation rather than uh, play uh, encouragement or play soliciting. So that's our first one. So hopefully that will... Uh, that will have uh, got you looking at your dogs in maybe a little bit of a different way. And myth number two is the idea that rolling over is submissive. And this one is kind of close to my heart because I, um, I already mentioned I have two cats. And I'm sure that, you know, lots of people like myself are both, you know, cat lovers and dog lovers. And actually, of course, the whole idea that rolling over in a cat is in any way submissive. If you own a cat or you've ever stroked a cat that has rolled over and exposed its belly to you is, you know, basically laughable because we all know that if a cat rolls over and you put your hand down to rub its tummy, probably the next thing that's going to happen is that you're grabbed by all the dog's weapon, oh, excuse me, the cat's weaponry. You know, you're grabbed by teeth, by claws, and let's face it, they've got quite a lot of them. And when they're in this rolled over uh, posture, of course, they ha effectively have all of their uh, weaponry available to them. So I think the, uh, the interesting thing is that, you know, I often learn um, cross species. So I, I think I've learned a huge amount actually about dog behavior from cat behavior and vice versa. And so when we look at uh, the idea that rolling over in dogs might be submissive, again, I wonder whether this is really a very much a human um, sort of idea 
that um, somehow we think it's all to do with top dog and bottom dog and who's on top and who's underneath and all this sort of thing. Um, and that actually we've sort of got our, our little mindset perhaps and certainly, um, you know, average pet owners, if you ask them, you know, what's your dog doing when it rolls over? They will often say it's, the dog is being submissive. But think back to my lovely picture of Hillary Clinton. Think back to context because that will tell you what's really going on. And um, here's a, a clip. This is um, my dear, dear golden retriever and my gorgeous little Chihuahua cross. And this is in the first uh, few days that I actually had the Chihuahua cross. Um, and very quickly, these two dogs formed a really lovely bond and would do the most lovely play together. I mean, this is all um, super consensual. This is all um you know, very carefully orchestrated. Um, look how he tosses him over, <laughs> over the top. Um, and the golden retriever in particular is just an amazing social dog. He had incredible social skills with other dogs. But what I hope you would look at when you're, when you're seeing this is that actually the play is really nicely balanced. Um, nobody is having to be, um, you know, I hate to use the word dominant. So you know what I mean? Nobody's having to be pushy. No one's having to be over demonstrative about being on top. In fact, you're seeing tons of mirroring. So actually, the Goldie rolls over, not in any way to be submissive, but in order to do this thing that we call self handicapping when he's playing with this much smaller dog. So he's saying, I'm coming down to your level. And I'm playing in a way that actually is going to be, whoops, <laughs> mostly highly appropriate to you. And the little Chihuahua cross actually mirrors him and does a lot of lying down and a lot of this uh, jaw wrestling stuff as well. And this is the, the kind of stuff that if you're looking at whether play is appropriate, these are the sorts of things you need to be asking yourself. Is the play balanced? Is the play, um, does the play have mirroring going on? Um, does the dog that perhaps might otherwise have the weight or size advantage self-handicap in order to make sure that the play is appropriate? Do the dogs look relaxed? I mean, you can immediately see, I hope from you know where this uh, this clip ends, how relaxed um, you know this this body posture is, um, and the same from this guy too, with the leg sticking out to one side. And um, and you know, are there little natural breaks in the play? In the play, that's always a very good thing to look for too. Um, so all of those things tell you that this is not a dog that's lying down in any way, shape or form to be submissive to this one. And neither is this one lying down to be submissive to this one. This is about forming really lovely social relationships and making sure that actually when you play with somebody else who's smaller or lighter or less practiced and experienced than you, um, that you make uh, allowances for that. And I always think that this is like... Um, you know, playing when you're a child, playing a, a sort of an adult game like kind of tennis or chess or something like that, you know, with a grown up, you actually just to begin with, you don't want them to be kind of patronizing, but you do want them just to give you a little bit of helping hand. Because if they thrash you at tennis every single time, you know, you're eight years old and they thrash you at tennis every time they you go out onto the court. Let's be honest, you're never going to want to play with them again. So really important that this uh, type of play denotes good balance between the two. And again, from previous webinar, all these these little gestures, all these lovely little social things are keep going signals that tell the other dog, I'm really enjoying this. This is lovely. This is relaxed. This is fun. Let's keep going. Let's do do some more of it. And um, And they did. They did lots of it. I think poor old Jack misses his golden retriever friend, although I did I did get Sky. So he plays a lot with Sky, which is really nice. And here's another little clip. And this is um, one that may also, uh, I hope, get, get you thinking a little bit differently about, um, you know, perhaps just what some of these thing, things are that we accept. So, you know, we've already said that probably rolling over is, is not submissive. But I also think that actually when we look at quite a lot of uh, dog body postures and body language signals, we tend to use the word appeasement. And let me tell you, in my in the last two years of looking at and filming dogs and looking at the clips over and over again and slowing them down and asking myself all the time, what am I really seeing? Um, actually, a lot of the time, what I thought was appeasement is not at all. 
And if you've ever seen, um, particularly a young dog, often it's um, youngsters who haven't quite worked out um, appropriate social interactions with other dogs yet, um, they will often do things where I think, are you are you f- crazy? You fool! You know you're you're doing something that's practically suicidal. You know I I see um, adolescent dogs particularly taking risks by, um, for example, licking another dog's jowls until the other dog finally turns around and glares at it and says, "If you don't stop doing that, I may have to." you know, be really quite forceful about it. Um, And yet you would think, well, isn't licking around the other dog's mouth a sort of an appeasement gesture? Um, Well, the answer is not not if it's gone as far as making the other dog want to kill it because it's so annoying. Um, So interestingly, I think, um, although it's very risky, of course, to ascribe um, any form of human emotions onto dogs, but I do see particularly adolescent, you know, teenage dogs taking risks with other dogs that I think, good grief, you know, if you're an adult dog, there's no way you'd get away with that. And I wonder if um, in a lot of dog to dog interactions, particularly where we see a little bit of um, friction, and the dog is especially when they're in that adolescent stage, whether actually there is some enjoyment to be had from that little frisson of fear that they might get that little frisson of risk taking. So often when people say to me, um, you know, their dog has developed a a dog to dog problem. And I ask how it started. They'll say to me things like, you know, I'm so amazed because actually as a youngster and as an adolescent, he just wanted to play madly with other dogs all the time. He loved playing with other dogs. And actually what I sort of wonder is, I wonder whether he was actually practicing some of these really annoying behaviors with other dogs and was slightly enjoying winding the other dogs up. Um, And that has then persisted into adulthood because he's learned um, that those things, A, get him some enjoyment. And that's probably enjoyment at quite a neurochemical level. Um, You know, that's probably the stuff of dopamine release in the brain and, you know, all the all the things that, you know, make dogs slightly addicted to behaviours. And it might also just be that other things happen as well. So owners intervene, um, you know, they get taken away from the situation. The other dog gets taken away from the situation, perhaps, too. Um, or they're kind of allowed to bully an adult dog. And I think that is very, very addictive uh, for lots of youngsters. And, you know, one of the things that I would always say to people is if you get a a new puppy and you have a very tolerant adult dog at home, uh, do not allow your puppy to jump on top of uh, the adult dog and bite their ears and steal their food and take their toys because you are absolutely setting yourself up for a a dog that has dog to dog issues later on. Um, In fact, in my puppy classes, I often describe it as being a little bit like allowing your toddler to beat up your uh, the toddler's grandfather. You know, it's just not appropriate. You know, you wouldn't sit toddler on on granddad's lap and say, oh, look, it's so cute. He's punching granddad in the face, but granddad doesn't mind. Oh, isn't granddad tolerant of the little one? You know, we just wouldn't wouldn't allow it, you know. So I really think it's very important that actually if you get a new puppy, particularly if the, your adult dog is very tolerant, is you do lots of protection of your adult dog. And, um, you know, you put in lots of management in place to make sure that you're not creating uh, a little monster. So I'm not suggesting that this particular uh, dog here is a little monster um, in the making. But what he does, excuse me, what he does show in this uh, particular video clip is actually rolling over and rolling over, not necessarily as submission or appeasement. Um, He's about to put his bottom on the other dog's Kong, which might end in tears. But uh, he he goes up. He's really sort of saying to this other dog, I want to interact. And then look how he pushes the adult dog away with his back paws. You know, that's not appeasement. That's not submission. And then he does a a sort of yip and throws himself on his back again in front of the adult dog. Come on, do that again. Come on, do that again. And um, really interesting how I guess, you know, the, the average man in the street or woman in the park it's probably going to look at that and say, oh, look, you know, the the puppy's being really sweet and submissive to the adult dog. And actually, what I would say is that that doesn't look like submission at all to me. Uh, You know, this this looks like crazy fun uh, to be had by a dog that's heading into adolescence. And, uh, you know, we we may just need to do a little bit of intervention to say you can't wind up your elders and betters in quite that fashion. I think, you know, it's an important important thing, important point to make. 
So um, I guess at, at sort of at, at this point, I love this picture, by the way. Look at these these two guys. Um, I guess, you know, it would be lovely for me to be able to ask everybody on the on the uh, the call, you know, why it is that you uh, were attracted to want to come to the webinar this evening. And um, I'm guessing that, like me, you're just absolutely hooked on dog body language and facial expression. And that every time there's one on the TV or that you, you know, see one even out of the car window, um, you're looking at it and looking at how it's interacting with its owner and looking at how perhaps it's interacting with other dogs as well. Um, and I, I guess, you know, I've really never sort of divulged this before. I, I, there are two aspects to this. One is it's a good thing my husband isn't listening because I actually did a rough count of all the dog books that I own. And um, I think this is a really a, a confession. Um, I think I have about 900 dog books. Um, and out of that sort of vast library, um, the sort of thing that I haven't really ever told anybody is that I went right the way through the library um, about five years ago, actually, and hunted for sort of the book of my dreams, if you like, in terms of dog body language and facial expression. And actually, what I discovered is that out of the 900 books that I that I, that I own, or at least that's the ones that I admit to owning anyway, um, probably got more than that, is that only really three of them um, had anything like what I was looking for in terms of explanations about um, body language and facial expression in dogs. And really sadly, two out of those three, um, I, I just can't recommend to other people because they talk about dominance in dogs and rank structure and how even dogs that have never met each other before will apparently form you know this um this dominance hierarchy instantaneously and one's the top dog and one's not and you know i i, I mean this is a, obviously a talk for a whole nother uh, lecture but um you know i really don't subscribe to that and i and i feel that probably the vast majority of of uh, behavior specialists and trainers and people that are, are interested in dog behavior in this country don't subscribe to that anymore. So that was that was a one dilemma. And then in the other book, which is, you know, really a, a super book and, and very well put together. And um, again, I, I sort of I do recommend it to people, but I would love to be able to sort of wholeheartedly recommend it more um, because it talks about calming signals. And I'm going to go and talk about that in a, in a second. And those of you that have, have heard me speak before or have, um, listened to me in masterclasses, um, know that I'm I'm quite upfront about that. You know, I, I appreciate that it's probably a little bit controversial for some people. Uh, probably some people are sitting, you know, in their front room thinking, what's a calming signal? Well, that's that's a good place to start. You can go away and look that up on the internet. Um, and then there are other people who are probably thinking, gosh, you know, actually, I've been looking at this whole idea of calming signals, the idea that one dog can give um, a signal to another dog in, in order to try and calm the other dog's behavior down. And that I haven't really been entirely sure about that. Um, you know, I haven't, haven't really been entirely convinced that that is exactly what's going on. Um, and anyway, the bottom line is that it got me really frustrated. And, and I thought, you know, the reality is that what I would really love is to be able to say to people, you know, this is this is the, the way that you learn about dog body language. And I, I passionately believe that you can teach anybody to read dog body language if you give them the right clues and make it fun and interesting and visual you know through images and and film clips because of course you know when it's actually um, active when you can see the dogs interacting right in front of you and you can watch the clips over and over again you can drill down into the detail and you can really see what matters actually to the other dog as well as um, you know perhaps what it, what matters to your human mind and I kind of worked out that actually it wasn't just me that felt this um, because so many of my uh, canine behavior students on my courses and things basically kept uh, sort of, you know, saying to me that what they would really love to do is is sort of look over my shoulder, I guess, uh, when I'm looking at a clip of dog body language um, or just dogs interacting generally. Um, and so because of that, I thought, right, well, if you want to look over my shoulder, I wonder if there's a way of, of me doing that. And so actually I put together the um, the online Learn to Talk Dog program, uh, which I know many of you have, have done. And I've been so appreciative appreciative of your feedback on that. It's been fantastic. And um, as a result, I've added more bits in some areas of the course as well. Um, and 
I've also gone on and created the dog to dog body language program as a follow on to that, although it can be taken in its um, in its own right as well. Uh, but I have to confess that um, I did get a little bit carried away with this particular course um, because those of you that have already um, seen it, done it, looked at it will know that there are three main modules meetings, greetings, stalking and splitting. And I have to be honest, stalking and splitting are probably my two absolute favourite things to talk about because they're so fascinating. Why dogs stalk other dogs as if they're prey um, and then bounce up at the end and say hello to them. And also this uh, idea of splitting where dogs will actually run between two dogs that look like they're in conflict, um, seemingly to try and reduce the conflict between those two dogs, which is really interesting. Um, play, sex and conflict. And you can imagine which bit of that is my uh, absolute favourite. Um, and then the final module, which is predicting dog to dog aggression, because I feel if we can spread a bit of that information about my word, wouldn't it be a different world that we could live in walking our own dogs? Um, so this is really what what sort of persuaded me to put it together. And um, I just you know, I I'm, uh, really wanted to just share it with everybody, make sure that everybody um, has the opportunity, because at the end of the webinar this evening, I'm going to go on and talk about um, the third myth in a minute. But at the end of the webinar this evening, um, I actually have a very special offer for you on the uh, Learn to Talk Dog Secrets of Dog to Dog Communication Programme. Um, and that's because, quite honestly, um, I want to feel like I can... Uh, shuffle off this mortal coil when my time is right, um, knowing that I've actually made the world a little bit of a safer place for dogs. Um, so that's that's kind of a little bit about uh, the course. So just heading back to our third myth, and I've already mentioned it because I wanted to forewarn you a little bit that it's a little bit controversial. And that is that I think that we should be really careful if we describe a body language signal or gesture as a calming signal. And there are lots of reasons why I think that it's it's risky. Um, what I want to be clear about is that I think it's one of those areas where perhaps different people probably mean different things by the term now. Um, exactly the same way as the D word, you know, the dominance word um, sort of gets bandied around and different people probably mean different things by it. Um, and it's a little bit difficult, I think, to always ascertain what people do mean uh, by it. But I think the important thing is that it's it's very uh, tempting to want to classify. And I made that um, comment earlier on about making assumptions. It's tempting to want to classify behaviours in certain ways. And I think that the calming signal um, terminology it can actually be really problematic with that. Um, so when I'm looking at, at dogs interacting, very often what I'm actually doing is looking for red flags and green flag behaviours. And um, again, probably you'll have heard that expression before. And red flag behaviours really mean things that would, would set up a little warning signal in my mind about what might be going on between the two dogs. And green flags are all about saying, this is great, this is fantastic, you know, let's carry on. This is, it's a keep going signal, keep going, I'm enjoying myself, this is lovely. And I think that actually sometimes what we think we're seeing in terms of red flags and green flags get confused with this term, which is, is the whole thing about calming signals. And so actually what I've got for you here is, um, is a, another clip of my gorgeous boy um, and a really lovely um, uh, collie, uh, collie cross possibly, um, that was um, in uh, the rescue centre waiting for a good home. You will be very glad to know that she got a fantastic home. So you don't have to ring me and say, can I home her? Um, it wasn't with me, sadly, but it was with, uh, with somebody else who's given her a really lovely home. And what I want you to do when you're looking at this um, clip is actually to um, ascertain, you know, what, what the intention of the collie is and therefore what the response of my Goldie is to that. I hope you're noticing the bows and a little shake off from him. 
It's a little relief of tension. And what you might want to notice is how he looks at her and then looks away and looks at her and then looks away. And in conventional thinking, when he looks away, turns his face away, that would be often described as a, a calming signal. But if I show you the clip again, what I would suggest is that actually the collie's intention, being a collie, being a herding dog, look how she wants to target his back end quite a lot of the time and how she wants to make him move. Do you see how she dips her head? She's thinking about nipping him round the back on his stifles or his, uh, or his back of his legs. And he knows that, he sees it. The bow there is to try and get him to move because she wants to make him move and then chase. She goes round the back again. And then when she looks towards his face, when she comes towards the front, she basically says, what I'd like to do is actually engage you in um, some mouth wrestling. You know, I'd like to put my mouth on you. And he says, by turning his face away and then back again, you don't have permission to do that. So the face goes away, no permission. And when she says, OK, fine, I'll look away a little bit. He then turns back to make sure she's not going around the back end in order to you know, have a little um, fun time uh, chasing his ankles, which is probably what he'd like to do. So this is what I would describe as that she's an adolescent. She's risk taking. See how she came in for contact there and he stopped her with her open mouth towards his neck. She goes around the back, looks at his ankles. He says, no, you don't. I'll engage with the front end. I'll give you permission for that, but you don't put your mouth on me. She does a bow to try and make him move. He says, no, I stay where I am. I've met your sort before. You're lovely, but we play these, this game by my rules. She comes around the front again. He engages her with eye contact to stop her because she's full frontal towards him. He keeps his eye on her again. She does a sort of sweet little, oh, I think I'll just come around here. And he says, no, you have no permission. And then I've got my eye on you, which moves her away again. So a beautiful little bit of dancing between the two dogs. Um, it's effectively like a little bit of choreographed um, dance moves where one says, I'll try this. And the other says, ah, maybe not. Um, and because he's a very confident, very social um, dog and he's, he, um, he's seen it all before and done it all before, he feels very happy, very confident being able to say to her, um, actually, no, I can just maneuver you, manage you with my eye contact and with saying I give you permission or I don't give you permission and so actually really if there's kind of one thing that I would like you to think about um, you know beyond above and beyond the webinar this evening is that I believe that when you have uh, dogs that are interacting dog to dog um, interactions whether they're dogs that know each other or whether they're dogs that have never met before the most important part of any um, uh, sort of genuine interaction between them is that any kind of body contact between them must be consensual. And I see so often, um, you know, dogs that will sort of, you know, rush out of the, uh, you know, out of the trees in the park and rush over to another dog and they're straight on top of them. Or they, they uh, you know, they use their mouths or their feet straight away. They say, you know, hello, here I am. I'm on top of you. And actually that's incredibly rude in the dog world. You know, body contact, much like people, actually, uh, close body contact must be consensual. Really important. So if you are ever stuck and you say to yourself, I don't know whether this is play or whether it's getting out of hand. I don't know whether to feel comfortable with it or not. That's the question that you should ask yourself. Is this consensual? Is, are the two dogs saying, yes, that's absolutely fine. We can carry on like that, like my golden retriever and the little chihuahua cross that you saw earlier? Is it consensual between them? That's really the message that we want to, um, to ask ourselves every single time we see uh, dogs play together in that way or have, have any kind of contact together in that way. And this is why um, I actually I mentioned earlier one of the aspects of um, the Learn to Talk Dog, Dog to Dog program is actually looking at whether or not body language is consensual and being able to tell whether or not you can predict that it will be. And there are certain aspects um, in that. I mean, for example, um, in module one with meeting, meetings and greetings um, about how much of dog to dog contact is actually done without them ever having direct contact at all. And 
just how important it is that we appreciate that dogs do an awful lot of their um, understanding about whether the greeting is going to be um, be nice, is going, whether it's going to be friendly, whether it's going to be um, you know all appropriate, is actually done even before they meet each other. Um, I also talk about how important it is that when dogs do that first approach, when actually you see a dog in the distance, how important it is that you as an owner can predict whether or not that other dog is going to be okay or not. Because I mentioned earlier that sometimes I'll say to my my little gang, you know, let's hightail it out of here, let's head off, um, you know, back in a different direction. That's because I make an assessment of the other dog that's approaching. And, you know, sometimes I'll say, absolutely fine, that's going to be lovely. You know, I can tell that we're all going to have a lovely, a lovely time meeting and greeting this one. On other occasions, I say, no, I really think that just on the basis of me seeing another dog approaching, we're going to avoid. So um, really important, I think, that, you know, all owners should be able to do that. Um, in the second module, I mentioned about the, um, the whole idea of, of sex. And here I talk about how sex can be used as a weapon. And this goes along with um, the uh, consensual aspect of body contact. And actually, um, you know, very often, particularly mounting and precursors to mounting are absolutely not consensual for the other dog. And so sometimes where I see... Um, you know, dogs that have really quite serious um, dog to dog issues, um, you know, I'll ask the owner, you know, what kinds of play did that dog engage with, particularly with another dog that lives with that dog at home? And they will say things like, oh, yes, it played, you know, mad rough games and uh, it did lots of mounting. Uh, they would mount each other, but he would always want to mount the other one. Um, and sometimes that would result in a little bit of aggro, a little bit of conflict. And other times, actually, they would just roll around on the floor and uh, practice this behavior between them. Um, so I think it's very important, actually, we understand that um, I personally believe that there's no such thing as anything accidental um, in dog behavior. You know, dogs will um, move in a certain way. They respond in certain ways because of how fast they are. Um, I can honestly say that dogs don't um, don't do things by accident. And so as a result of that, if you see something, you think, gosh, you know, that's that's a little bit of a puzzle. Um, then I would always ask myself, you know, what's what's the result of that? You know, what what was the dog's intention and what was the result? Um, in fact, I think um, somebody did actually send me a really lovely question uh, for this evening, which was about um, a dog that she meets. I think that this particular lady uh, meets this dog on walks. Um, yeah, so she said uh, it's a four-year-old um, Old English sheepdog and it chases her golden retriever snapping at the back of his neck. Um, and it says that the, the, old, the Old English uh, continued to chase her dog and her dog was stressed. And she asks, is this just play? And my answer is absolutely not. Uh, this, is, this is really rude. Um, you know, this is like somebody coming up to you um, on the bus and, you know, slapping on the back of the head. Um, you know, that's not playful. I mean, even if they think it's playful, it's, it's certainly not. You know, there is no consensual aspect to it at all. Um, so actually, you know, even if it's not causing a fight with uh, with your particular dog because your dog's very tolerant, um, absolutely, I would say that he's he's risk taking. You know, this particular dog is risk taking, and um, and if I was that owner, I would never let that dog do that again. Um, and I don't mean that in a in a compulsive way, but I would use lots of good positive training, positive management to make sure that I didn't allow that to happen. Um, so really important, I think, that we can all assess what's healthy play between dogs and what isn't. Because of this speed that dogs have, um, as I'm sure everybody uh, is aware, and you've probably, everybody has had it happen to them as well, is actually that things can get out of hand incredibly quickly. And then before you know it, um, you're actually dealing with, you know, dog to dog conflict rather than meeting and greeting or play. So I think much better to be able to predict what's happening um, and assess uh, things very quickly and then make a decision on behalf of your own dog. And of course, if you're working with clients on behalf of their dogs too, um, about what's, uh, what's healthy and what isn't, what's okay and what's not. And then uh, module three, um, whilst I would love to be able to give everybody a, a crystal ball to be able to predict dog to dog aggression, um, the reality is that actually what we need to do is to, to act like a detective and we need to say you know given xyz given you know this number of red flag behaviors in this interaction uh, then i can make a prediction that probably it's not going to be a, a good outcome it's not going to be a good scenario so i think it's really important that um, particularly we look at how um, dogs are developing in terms of their social skills 
And actually, one of the things I'm really obsessed with is how we allow puppies to play um, and how we allow puppies to interact with other dogs when they're very young and whether we're actually uh, risking those puppies developing dog to dog aggression. So if uh, if you're involved in any way in puppy classes or puppy parties at a vet practice, uh, puppy play sessions of, of any kind, really important. You know exactly what you're looking at um, so that you can make an, a, a very good judgment about whether or not you actually might be influencing a potential later problem between dogs. Um, so, you know, certainly we, we need to have the end in mind the whole time. What is the adult dog going to look like um, in terms of its behavior? And how are we helping that dog to either be good with other dogs or not so good with other dogs um, by how we allow that puppy to interact with other dogs when they're very young? Um, it's interesting, actually, that in my area, we've had um, several uh, puppy playgroup sessions start up. Um, they're not puppy classes, they're uh, playgroups and they're free for, for owners. Um, and one of them that's relatively local to me, they advertise that you can bring your puppy from eight weeks to a year old. And you can bring your puppy and you can have a lovely time watching your puppy off lead, playing amongst 20 to 30 other dogs in that age bracket. And let me tell you, it is absolutely a recipe for disaster. Um, so really um, essential, I think, that you know we need to start to be much more upfront about how dogs learn to use aggression, um, why they might, because of course, if they're in that situation and they're practicing it and perhaps they've been a victim in that situation, uh, why they might develop a, a dog's dog problem really important as well. Um, so that's what this uh, you, this module is all about. And it's about making sure that you know we do everything we can to prevent problems. And then where we have got a problem, and uh, it particularly, uh, so a huge thank you to all those people that sent questions in this evening about their own dogs. And um, you know I'm aware that it's, it's really stressful and really difficult if you've got a dog to dog problem, you know, your dog's uh, problematic with other dogs out and about, is that one of the things that's very rarely considered in that mix is whether or not the dog might be guarding you as a resource and that's something that crops up time and time again um, that people just don't think about the fact that the dog might actually be um, that people often term it as protecting the owner but actually really what they're doing is um, guarding the owner because the owner is a resource that they want to keep all to themselves um, so that's the reason why that's so important that we look at that aspect so if um we want to be one step ahead if you want to look over my shoulder. Um, the dog to dog uh, communication course is really designed to, to do all of that for you. It's got over 90 clips. I think it really did get a bit carried away. My poor family sort of said, you know, could you please just leave the video camera at home occasionally, Sarah? And I said, no, I have to have it at all times to take video clips of dogs whenever I can. Um, and it's really just a chance to actually look at in depth at uh, me being able to explain what I'm seeing in these clips so that you can keep your dog safe around unknown dogs um, and that you can assess dogs really rapidly because that's kind of my my dream is that everybody should be able to do that. Also to be able to prevent problems in dogs later on um, so that we know that we bring up our puppies in, the, in absolutely the way that, um, that we the best way that we possibly can. And to understand the predictors of aggression so that you can intervene, because I do think it's up to us as, as you know, good, responsible human beings. We're part of a team with our dog. And so really important that we intervene uh, where we think we need to, uh, but also have the knowledge that we can take a step back where we don't need to as well. Um, so my mission, as I said, is to, is to really spread the word. Um, as far as I possibly can. Um, and if you feel as, as passionately as I do about um, about your dogs, as I do about mine and keeping them safe when they're out and about, then um, that's why I've um, arranged this offer for you. And the course itself is normally £347 um, and it's on a special offer till six o'clock only tomorrow night at £147. Um, and that's... Um, because it's a thank you for you uh, coming on, listening to my webinar this evening. Um, and also, as I say, because I'm so passionate about wanting to spread the word uh, about making sure that we can all walk our dogs as safely as we possibly can um, and that they enjoy the interactions uh, with other dogs and, you know, rather than um, feeling concerned about them. Um, so 
just to reiterate that offer is only open till six o'clock tomorrow night i'm very strict about such matters um mostly because it's friday night and it's six o'clock and the offer comes down six o'clock on a friday night so if you're keen um to to get on that program at that special price uh, you just need to go to the url which is up on the screen there which is learn to talk dog.com forward slash special um so that's there for you so i thought i'd just spend um uh, just a few minutes because we're we're nearly up um, on our time this evening. Um, just talking a little bit about some of the questions that I've had this evening, um, and some of them have been, you know, really interesting and fascinating. And if I haven't um, included your question here, um, it's probably because it actually will require me to ask you some questions about it. So if it's a particularly complex um, case, you know, I'm sure you appreciate that I would need to ask you questions about that in order to be able to. You know, potentially send you in the right direction to to get the right kind of help. Um, I actually do always think, by the way, even if you're a dog trainer or a behaviour uh, specialist yourself, it's really interesting to actually get somebody else's view on your dog and your dog's behaviour. I always love it when other people tell me about my dog's behaviour. Um, I actually go to um, I, I go to training myself. Um, I go to the wonderful Joanna Hill um, for um, obedience training, and although I don't. I'm sure I hope she's not listening because I haven't actually booked to ever compete with my dog. But I love going to the training and I love the fact that she tells me about my training with my dog. It's it's really a fantastic thing to do. So if you have a problem with your own dog, I always think it's a good idea to get help from somebody else, if only because it's so fascinating. Um, so I have um, one question here, which is uh, from and now I'm going to really make sure I say your name right, which is David. Um, I checked how I say your name, so I'm really hoping I get that right uh, this evening. Um, and that's um, about um, your dog, Bunty, and she's a rescue dog. And you say that she's nervous outside on, on the lead and you've done a lot of work with her and she's much improved. So thank you for that from her because she's obviously fallen on her feet. Lucky girl. Uh, and she gets panicky when she sees other dogs and she'll lunge at them if they come too close. Um, but you're a bit bemused by this because you've got another dog at home and she's absolutely fine with that dog. And she previously lived in a foster home with other dogs and she was fine with them as well. Um, and so, you know, what is it that's different about her relationship with those other dogs? And then when she meets other dogs outside and, you know, you ask a very good question, which is how can you differentiate between her wanting to you know, be aggressive towards another dog and perhaps just wanting to play and being frustrated that she can't play? And I would say that there's a number of questions here that are really worth um, asking yourself. And the first of those is, you know, would she be any different if somebody else was holding the lead? So if um, a complete stranger took her out for a walk, would she be different with other dogs than she is uh, when she's with you? And also, if she was on a longer lead, so if she was further away from you, do you think that actually she would um, behave differently? So if she had more freedom and was further away from you, would she behave less uh, well or better? And those questions, if you ask yourself those questions, actually will help you because they will direct your thinking as to whether she's perhaps doing a little bit of resource guarding. And this is a really common thing, particularly in dogs that have been rehomed and that have been insecure in the past. And I'm not being anthropomorphic about this. There's some good research actually it proves that, um, you know, dogs that have had... Um, uh, more than one home, particularly over adolescence, um, that actually they're more likely to form very strong bonds and very strong attachments with a new owner uh, when they feel secure. And so actually that very strong bond um, can sometimes lead to a little bit of resource guarding. So that would be the question that I would want to ask is, you know, is there a possibility that actually she's resource guarding you, which is, of course, terribly flattering, but also extremely annoying because that's why she's then behaving like that. And so if the answer is that you think that might be a possibility, then I would definitely seek some one to one behavior help, um, get somebody to come out with you, show you how to manage that, because it's one of those areas where um, you really need to be able to say to her, you know, I'm um, I'm on the end of the lead, but actually I don't need you to um, to guard me from other dogs. You know, I am yours and yours alone. You don't need to worry. So you need to be able to get that message across to her. And that's actually quite a complex thing to do. Um, so definitely to have somebody to give you some help with that. Um, and I have another question from Lynn. Thank you, Lynn. Um, and this is about your dog, uh, poor thing, um, has had uh, luxating patella surgery. Um, and that means that actually the, the dog has had limited socialization and limited training because, of course, you've got to keep the dog quite quiet, um, you know, over that period, you know, uh, pre and post uh, operatively 
And I experienced this actually with one of my own dogs with the Chihuahua cross. He had uh, both hips removed um, when he was um, about six months old. And certainly I learned a lot about keeping a dog um, entertained and stimulated, but without um, running around a lot. Um, and it, and it's, uh, it's a challenge. Um, but what you say is that actually when you now do training with um, him, I think it's him, um, that actually he gets um, overtired quickly and also overenthusiastic quickly because of the rewards that are on offer. And what I would say to you is that actually there, there might be um, some strategies that you could use in how you actually deliver the food. So I don't know if you're, a, um, if you're using clicker training or um, uh, whatever, but certainly um, there are some excellent video clips out there. Emily Larlam has some really super clips on her YouTube channel um, about how to use the food in training, because it's not just about what type of food you use. It's also about how you deliver it that matters. And um, I love the expression that there's a big difference between fine dining um, and fast food. So it sounds to me like your dog is anticipating fast food. Um, that is going to be highly exciting, rather arousing. Uh, the food's going to get delivered um, in, a, in a speedy fashion. And actually what you need to do is to slow everything down and say to the dog, when you've done the right thing, then you may enjoy the delights of fine dining. And that is going to be slow and considered. And it's also going to require a bit of impulse control, which for a seven month old dog is pretty difficult anyway. So I would say two things to focus on. One is um, the, del the delivery of the food, making sure that it's um, very slow and maybe using tiny little pieces of food that you deliver one after the other. So there's very little gap between them. Um, and also that you work on some impulse control exercises um, with, your, with your pup, um, because overall those really help just generally. And actually, one of the things that I have found is that I think impulse control um, in adolescent dogs is always a really good thing to teach because the more you can teach them impulse control just in general training, actually, the better they become at having impulse control around other dogs as well. So that has a, level, a lovely sort of double whammy to it. So with that um, said, I hope that you've enjoyed this evening and I hope that you've you've gained a little bit from it. I hope you've enjoyed the uh, the things that we've talked about. As I say, I struggle to only think of or well, only to only have three um, myths because I really could have, have happily uh, filled your entire night with with myths about dog to dog communication. Um, please do check out the uh, special offer, which, as I say, only lasts until six o'clock tomorrow evening. Um, and if you know somebody that you think would benefit from um, listening to this uh, webinar, that they would enjoy it too. Um, I'm very much hoping that we will get it out as a recording. And um, if you want somebody else to join our list so that they receive um, notification of when the recording is ready, I'm very happy to do that. Um, so if you if you whiz us an email or get them to sign up at the Learn to Talk Dog um, website on the homepage there, and then I'll make sure that they get the recording of the webinar as well, um, because really it's all about spreading the word. So I hope you've enjoyed it. Please, off you go. Make sure you have a lovely glass of wine and give your dogs a big cuddle from me. Thanks very much indeed.